scrolling. So this lecture is about membrane transport. I've talked in another lecture about the electrochemical gradient, and that should be looked at separately for an in-depth view of how the electrochemical gradient can be used to set the membrane potential uh, across a membrane. So here, we're going to use the electrochemical gradient to help substances cross membranes and um, to understand how nerve cells work. So I'm going to talk more about the action potential in ner neurons. What I'd like you to be able to do is explain the mechanisms by which substances cross. And so that means what energy would be required, whether it's passive or active transport. Um, that is, and predict the direction of movement. And understand how cells use the electrochemical gradient. And specifically, I'm going to focus on nerve cells and glucose transport. Later, in mitochondria and chloroplasts, we'll use the electrochemical gradient uh, to make ATP. So, as we've discussed, membranes are not permeable to polar molecules such as ions or glucose. S cells have small molecules and ions in different concentrations inside and outside. This sets up an electrochemical gradient because of chemical and osmotic forces. So osmotic forces are the difference in concentration. Electrical forces are the separation of charge. And charges don't like to be separated. So the electrical forces are large compared to the chemical forces when you're considering ions or other charged molecules. So what's inside cells? We have proteins, ions, which are different charges. We have metabolites such as nucleotides and nucleosides. And we have small ions like calcium, potassium, sodium. And in fact, sodium is pumped out of cells to avoid osmotic swelling. Because cells have so many charged molecules inside compared to outside, cells pump sodium out. The concentrations of ions in a typical mammalian cell are shown here. What's important to remember is that sodium is very high outside and low inside, and potassium is the reverse. Potassium is high inside and low outside. In addition, calcium is high outside, well, one to two millimolar, relative to a very small amount inside. Cells take great pains to pump calcium out of cells or into the ER, as we'll talk about later when we talk about signal transduction. In addition, chloride ions, which are negatively charged, are low inside and high outside of cells. The whole electrochemical gradient is set up by this guy, the sodium-potassium ATPase also known as the sodium pump. So this guy maintains the osmotic balance through an energy coupled or active transport. It's called an ATPase because it uses ATP to drive both sodium and potassium against their concentration gradients. So it forms the electrochemical gradient, it forms this separation of charge and different ion concentrations inside and outside. So it, it forms this battery, if you will. It's electrogenic. Energy is stored in this separation of charge. It contributes in total about 10% to the total membrane potential. Passive ion flow contributes the rest. In neurons, a significant amount of energy is used by this guy, the sodium pump, because ion fluxes are used for electrical signaling. That's how come we can have thoughts. That's how you can study cell biology and have dreams. So here's a cartoon of the sodium pump, the sodium potassium ATPase. It takes 
three sodium ions out and two potassium ions in. So this is the outside of the cell, this is the inside or cytosol. So it creates a potassium electrochemical gradient which has a driving force wanting the potassium to be driven out and a sodium electrochemical gradient in the other direction because sodium is high outside it wants to come in. It requires ATP to do this. Two potassiums, three sodiums for every ATP. So, because of this pump, potassium is high inside, sodium is high outside, and energy is stored in this electrochemical gradient. As we'll see later, it's because of mitochondria that the intracellular pH is low, that is the concentration of protons is a little bit higher inside cells than outside. And, potass uh, and calcium is pumped outside of cells, so calcium is used as a messenger for signal transduction, which we'll talk about later. So electrical forces arise from the separation of charge and concentration on one side versus another. The membrane potential is the difference in charge. The membrane potential arises when you have more positive ions on one side and more negative ions on another side of the lipid bilayer or membrane. The separation of charge creates an electrical force which means that only a small number of ions need to move to create a large electrical force. So the concentrations don't appreciably change to create a membrane potential. So why do we care about the electrochemical gradient? Well, why do we care about anything? It's because we have nerve cells. Nerve cells have a cell body and a long part called the axon and then terminal branches um, which then send the message to the next cell. What I'm going to talk about next is propagation of the action potential, that is a, a switching of charges across the membrane, which is an electrical signal from the cell body towards the terminal branches. The action potential always goes in one direction, and I'm going to tell you why. The action potential is quite fast. It's up to 120 meters per second. And the way it works is that the sodium channels let sodium in. Potassium channels then let potassium out. And so you have a momentary reversal of the membrane potential. It can be looked at this way, where you have positive charges on the outside and negative charges on the inside at the resting state. And that's true throughout the whole cell body. But there's a momentary switch where the sodium ions come in creating a membrane potential that's positive inside. So you get positive charges built up inside. And then potassium ions go out and it reverses back to normal again. So it's very fast and it's a momentary switch. And this little pulse of po positive charges starts at this end of the axon, axon, where the cell body is, and goes towards the terminal end. What I showed you in this other lecture where we talked about the electrochemical gradient, that the membrane potential can be set by opening and closing channels. The membrane potential is dictated by the relative conductance, that is whether channels are open or not. And so the resting potential in real cells is about minus 70 millivolts. And when they're depolarized, when they switch, they go to plus 20 to plus 50 millivolts in that little region of the nerve cell here. So this is about plus 20 to plus 50 membrane potential. And here the resting potential is about minus 70. All of this occurs just by opening and closing sodium and potassium channels. 
So how does that work? Two brilliant scientists named Hodgkin and Huxley figured this out a long time ago. The way they did it is they used squid axons. Squid have giant axons, so they can actually cut out a piece of axon, squeeze out all the ions and proteins in there, and replace them with buffer. And you have a membrane here, here's the axon, with the channels present. And you can, you can ask, you can, you can put electrodes on the inside and the outside of this squid axon, and you can connect it up to a voltage amplifier and set the voltage anywhere, and you can measure the current. So you can figure out what channels are opening by changing the buffer. So if you just put sodium in, you get sodium channels working. If you just put potassium, potassium, so, and so forth. So here's what they found. On these graphs, time is on the x-axis and membrane potential is on the y-axis. What they found was if they changed with their voltage uh, clamp amplifier, they just make a ch change in the membrane potential using the electrodes, they can get sodium channels to open if they change the voltage to a certain amount. That's called threshold potential. The sodium channels are closed until the membrane potential goes from about minus 70 to about minus 50 millivolts. These are called voltage gated. So the change in membrane potential, or the change in voltage, causes them to open all at once, only if they reach this threshold potential. Then they all open and you get a sodium current. That means that the current is flowing and the membrane potential changes, from inside negative to inside positive. So this represents the voltage-gated sodium channels opening as depicted here. They're closed until they're told to open. And then what happens? They don't stay open. They become inactivated. So the channel has three states. It has closed, it has open, and then they get tired. They need to rest, so they become inactivated. That is, it doesn't matter what the membrane potential is once they get activated. They just need to rest. They can only stay open for a short period of time. Period. It's kind of like having a cigarette. You know, you just need a break. If the membrane potential is not changed enough to open them, that's called a sub-threshold stimulation. That's the sodium. Sodium channels are voltage gated. So this in a squid axon is shown here. So if the direction of propagation is shown from left to right, and you measure the membrane potential at different spots in the, ax in the axon, you can see the sodium channel is opening here and then becoming inactivated. Opening here, becoming inactivated. Opening here at different times, okay? So in the view uh, of the channels themselves, they're at rest, the voltage change causes them to open, you get a current flowing around that, that's what these arrows are, the current is flowing in both directions, but the change in membrane potential can only activate these voltage-gated channels in front of the action potential because back here, they're having their rest. They're having their cigarette. They're inactivated. That's why it only grows in one direction. So at time two, this is the first time, this is the second time, these guys are resting, these guys are opening, and then they're subsequently opening the next batch. So the reason that the action potential goes in one direction is because when the membrane potential changes, it can only open the sodium channels in front of the action potential, not behind it. If you didn't have that inactivation mechanism, the, the thing, thing would come back, back and forth, and it would be a mess. No one could think. think. So the sodium channels become inactivated, and therefore, 
the action potential goes in one direction. Okay, that's sodium. We have also to consider potassium. So let's look at the potassium channels. Potassium channels play a big role. They open later. So they're just a little bit slower to open. They're also voltage gated. And they also become open and then inactivated and then closed again, just like the sodium channels. But they go a little slower. So they're responsible for returning the, the membrane potential back to the resting state. So the sodium channels open in the rising phase. The potassium channels open to bring the, the membrane potential back to the equilibrium membrane potential. And in fact, there's this third part where the sodium channels are closed and the potassium channels are still a little bit open. So the membrane potential goes a little bit below the resting potential. That's called after hyperpolarization. So in this part, the potassium channels are still a little bit open, so the current becomes inside negative, more negative than resting potential. And then eventually they become inactivated and it all resets. Here's another version of that diagram. There's um, two different lines here, two different colors. So again, time is on the x-axis, membrane potential on the y-axis. So if we look at the action potential over time, we have the rising phase and the falling phase and the after hyperpolarization. If you look just at the individual channels, you see that's this sort of yellowish curve here. The, the sodium channel conductance, that is that they're open, occurs rapidly. That's this line here and then falls, okay? So they open, become inactivated, and then stay closed. The potassium channels are slower, okay? They react a little bit slower to the change in membrane potential. They open and then close. They open, become inactivated, and then close. Because they're slower, they remain open for a little bit longer, causing this after hyperpolarization. But remember that potassium is going out of the cell, so that acts to bring the membrane potential, this white line, back down to inside negative. So let's go through this again, talking about the in action potential. So here again we have a graph of the total action potential with time on the x-axis and <clears throat> membrane potential on the y-axis. So if you look at the total uh, membrane potential, it goes um, from inside negative to inside positive, sodium channels opening, potassium channels then next, it goes back down to inside negative, and you have a small after hyperpolarization. Viewed in terms of the channels themselves, if you just look at the sodium conduction, um, the sodium channels are faster than the potassium channels. So in the action potential, when we're looking at the total cell membrane potential, you have the rising phase where the sodium channels are open and then become inactivated. And so you have the sodium current more than the potassium current, because the potassium channels aren't open yet at first. Then at the falling phase, where the membrane potential is going from inside positive back down to inside negative, the potassium channels are opening, letting those char positive charges out of the cell. Potassium channels are opening more slowly and then the potassium current is increasing as the sodium current is declining. Finally, at the after hyperpolarization stage, where it goes just a little bit more negative than resting potential, the membrane potential goes just below resting because um, potassium is still being conducted through the channels. So 
So that's the action potential. And it all rests on opening and closing sodium and potassium channels. Isn't that wonderful? Well, squid axons are big, and that's why they're fast. And I just want to tell you that mammals have this stuff called myelin. Myelin is kind of like an insulator for the wire. It's a sheet of membranes. It's a single cell that wraps around and around and around. And here's what it looks like by EM. I don't know if you can see. You can look in your book. It goes around and around. There's a cell body, and it, it wraps this axon in a kind of insulating, electrically insulating sheath. So what that does is it allows the action potential to go fast because you only need to conduct electricity at these nodes. These are called nodes of Ranvier. So you get the action potential jumping from one node to the next to the next, and it goes very fast. And that's how <clears throat> mammals can make their um, action potential go much faster by using small axons. Okay, so we've got our cell body and we've got an action potential. What starts here at the axon hillock. How do you get that message to the next cell? Because your nervous system is composed of many nerve cells. Well, let's talk about what happens here. For definitions, we call the presynaptic membrane. So if we focus our microscope just on this terminal branch of the axon, it's going to be connecting to the next cell. The next cell is called the postsynaptic membrane. And so if we focus in on just that little thing, that's called the synapse. The synapse is where <clears throat> the, the presynaptic membrane from this terminal branch, that's here, is closely abutted to the postsynaptic membrane. So the way it works is that when the action potential reaches this, then a, a small amount, so the membrane potential changes here, a small amount of calcium comes in, and that causes these little vesicles here to fuse with the plasma membrane. And these little vesicles have small molecules called neurotransmitters. Okay? Those are chemicals, small chemicals, such as acetylcholine, which bind to receptors, such as the acetylcholine receptor. And in the case of that receptor, it's a acetylcholine gated channel. So that receptor actually opens up a sodium channel to convert the signal from an electrical signal to a chemical signal back into an electrical signal on the next cell. So the action potential changing the membrane potential, the membrane potential causing the release of these neurotransmitter containing vesicles. The neurotransmitter binds to the receptor. That opens up channels, which is the receptor in this case, changing the membrane potential on the next cell. And that way, converting it back into an electrical signal. So these ion channels are kind of amazing, actually. I've told you about voltage-gated channels. Those are the sodium and potassium channels. They change in response to a change in membrane potential. And they can be closed or open or inactivated. They have to have their rest so that the action potential goes in one direction. I just told you about a ligand-gated channel, that is, acetylcholine, or another neurotransmitter, binds to a receptor and opens it when the receptor is bound to its ligand. Okay? Those are called ligand-gated. You can also have ligands on the inside of cells, which open channels. Finally, your hair cells in your ear to hear sound, they respond by moving according to sound waves. And that movement causes channels to open. That's called a mechanically gated channel. That's how we can hear sounds. So let's focus in a little bit more on um, 
the, the chemical to electrical signaling. So again, electrical signals, that is the change in membrane potential, are converted to chemical signals, that is the release of small molecules called neurotransmitters, which are then converted back into electrical signals. There are different neurotransmitters. Some of them open sodium channels. Some of them open chloride channels. The ones that open sodium channels help to depolarize the membrane and cause another excitatory signal. Okay, so those are called excitatory. If you turn it around the other way, some open chloride channels and those are actually inhibitory. Those drive the membrane potential more negative because remember chloride is high outside and low inside. So then you have an influx of negative charges and that actually inhibits the propagation of an action potential in the next cell. In a simple case, the neuromuscular junction is shown here. So here's an actual scanning EM showing an axon with myelin, so it's fat, forming a synapse on this muscle fiber. So this whole thing is a muscle fiber. The neurotransmitter that causes muscles to contract, here's my muscle contracting, I'm sending this muscle some electrical impulses. So how does the muscle know to contract? You convert it from an electrical signal on the nerve cell to a chemical signal, acetylcholine, and then the acetylcholine binds to acetylcholine receptors on the muscle cell. That lets sodium and calcium in. And then the muscle cell has an electrical change and that causes the actin and myosin to contract, uh, which we'll talk about in another lecture. So, this is, this is all due to what's called the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. That is, this is the one that binds nicotine. Yes, it's the same one that's in tobacco, nicotine. It's a model for how, <clears throat> how the channels can work when they bind to acetylcholine. There's two subunits that bind and open it. It's been extensively studied by Zach Hall and many other people. So there's lots of different receptors, there's lots of different neurotransmitters. And just to tell you, there's excitatory neurotransmitters which open sodium channels and inhibitory ones which open chloride channels. So excitatory neurotransmitters bind to um, their certain receptors such as the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Glutamate, yes, the same as the amino acid, is also stored in um, so small synaptic vessels and are released at the synapse. Serotonin you might have heard of. Those all activate sodium channels. And the result is an excitatory, stimulatory, excitatory postsynaptic potential, EPSP. Inhibitory ones are glycine and GABA, stands for gamma amino butyric acid. And interestingly, if you want to think about how drugs work, Valium which causes you to kind of go to sleep and not remember stuff, that uh, activates um, these receptors, the GABA receptors. So these are making your neur neurons less likely to fire. That's why they're inhibitory. So what's caused by that, if you let chloride in, is an, an inhibitory postsynaptic potential, or an IPSP. That drives the inside more negative, excitatory, drives the membrane potential more positive. If enough of these are present, then you can reach threshold and open sodium channels at this part of the axon, right next to the cell body. That causes firing of an axon to the next cell. So <clears throat> in real cells, there's a whole bunch of these synapses all over the cell, all over the cell body. And all the excitatory and inhibitory signals are summed 
in both space and time, right here at the axon hillock. And if the sum of all these signals leads to a change in membrane potential, which is beyond the threshold to open the sodium channels, then all the sodium channels here open, then you get an action potential firing, and that's how it works. That's all very interesting. So that's how nerve cells work, and we should appreciate those because that's happening all the time in your cells, all the time, even while you're sleeping because you dream and stuff. Okay, I'm going to shift gears now and talk about membrane transport. So there are proteins that ferry small molecules, including ions. We talk about the sodium potassium ATPase. But you also have to get glucose and other things in and out of cells. Importantly, if you have an electrochemical gradient where, for example, the concentration is higher on the outside of the cell and lower on the inside, then that does not require energy because the electrochemical gradient provides the energy to push the molecule from one side of the membrane to another. If, on the other hand, you want to transport stuff in the other direction against the electrochemical gradient, it requires energy. Okay? Energy could be uh, provided by a number of things. So those two things are called passive and active transport. So passive transport is when the electrochemical gradient is favorable. So in the case of sodium channels opening, the outside concentration is higher than the inside for sodium ions. So that's a passive transport through those channels. The sodium potassium ATPase, on the other hand, has to pump the sodium out and therefore requires energy in the form of ATP because it's going against the concentration gradient. So most of the membrane potential is provided by passive ion movements. So that it's because of the different distribution of all these molecules inside cells that we have a lot of passive ion movements that create the inside negative membrane potential in cells. And there are various ion channels or ionophores. Um, and there are transport proteins that ferry one thing to one, a, a molecule from one side to another. These guys, uniport for example, is one where the, the protein can change conformation, grabbing the molecule from one side and then changing conformation to dump it into the other side. That's called facilitated transport, where the electrochemical gradient is used. If you want to transport against the electrochemical gradient, you have to use energy. So light energy can be used, ATP, as in the sodium potassium ATPase, or you can use the energy in the electrochemical gradient. So that's called coupled transport. So one way to do it, if you want to take a uh, a molecule in that's against its gradient, you can couple it to something that's with its electrochemical gradient. Okay? That's called symport. You're going in the same direction. So here we've got an ion that is uh, favorable in its electrochemical gradient. The concentration's higher inside than outside. You can take another molecule in if you have a protein with binding sites for both. So the electrochemical gradient provides energy. You can also go the other direction, antiport. You can take something out using the electrochemical gradient of the ion that goes in. So the electrochemical gradient is an important provider of energy for transport of things both <clears throat> with their concentration gradient and against them because of these symport and antiport proteins. An example is glucose. Glucose is absorbed from the gut. The lumen is the inside of the intestine. Glucose comes from starch, and starch is broken down in the lumen of the gut. And then you have to get the glucose across the membrane 
from the lumen of the gut into the cell. Now the cell has a higher concentration of glucose than the lumen. So you need to be able to get it into from a lower to a higher concentration across the uh, epithelial membrane. The way it works is there's a sodium glucose symport. That is, the electrochemical gradient of high sodium outside is used to drive the glucose inside of the cell. So there's a co-transport of one sodium ion with one glucose molecule into the cell that drives glucose against its concentration gradient and then passive transport from the cell which has a higher glucose concentration than the bloodstream across the basolateral membrane. Thank you. And that's the end of this lecture.